My name is Beth Butler, and I am actually the chapter administrator for NOPE of Hillsboro, which stands for Narcotics Overdose Prevention Education. Joining me this evening is Master Deputy Howell, who is the school resource deputy from Newsom High School, along with Kathy Valdez. She is our NOPE chapter president, but she is also a lifelong educator and a former Hillsborough County School District administrator. And we wanna thank all of you so much for being here, whether it's for yourself, your child, your student, a loved one in your life that you're concerned about, we really do appreciate you being here. I'm going to begin to share my screen and I thank you for just a moment while I get this set up. NOPE is actually um, an entity that began back in 2004 down in West Palm Beach when some parents lost their child to an overdose when he went up to college at UCF. Our chapter has been around doing presentations since 2012-2013 school year. And what we do is we go into every middle school and high school in the Hillsborough, Hillsborough County School District and we share very powerful emotional presentations that fit the bell schedule, which makes it very easy for administrators to schedule us, but also it delivers stories from around the community of kids who thought they were just exper experimenting, just smoking a little weed. Gosh, they thought vaping was no big deal or drinking alcohol on the weekends wouldn't be a problem. And these children lost their lives. And some of the people that are on the photo boards of the stages that we set up in the auditoriums or the gymnasiums are students that some of the children have actually played hockey with, cheerleaded with, played minor league baseball with, not minor league, I'm sorry, pony league baseball with. And so it really resonates with them. In addition to those stories being shared during the presentation, the school resource deputy and school resource officer shares a very impactful story that involves a body bag and a 911 call. And then we have a family speaker that will share the story of their own loved one who started out in what seemed like a very normal setting and actually took a wrong direction and ended up losing their life very early to what is called an accidental overdose death. When we share these presentations in an auditorium or a gymnasium with 400 students or 600 students, you can hear a pin drop and we share three very important topics. We tell the students that they need to break that code of silence that they tend to keep with each other as a teenager and be the hero and let someone know that can help if anyone in their life is struggling with some type of substance abuse. We also talk to them about the fact that just one time can kill. And we stress the fact that even if you're experimenting with something that you think you know exactly what it is, that drug dealer could have laced it with fentanyl, which can kill a human being instantly. And the other thing that we stress in our presentations at schools and with parents is the 911 Good Samaritan Law. That law is something that so many people do not know about. And what it does is it protects the person calling who thinks that someone is overdosing right in front of them from getting into any legal trouble of any kind, even if they too were using illicit drugs or drinking underage. If you're making the phone call to protect someone from dying, from using substances, make that call to 911 and that 911 Good Samaritan Law will protect you from legal trouble. Now I mentioned at the end of our presentation, we will have time for questions and answers. So please stay on mute throughout the presentation. And if you'd like to put a question into the chat box so it can be anonymous, feel free to do that as we go along. In the meantime, we wanna share with you a public service announcement that was created by Blake High School students a couple of years ago that share with you some of the things we share with your students, your children during our powerful 50 minute presentation. Please watch. All right, I got them. What are those? I don't know, but the doses get too much super hot. Really? Yeah, and they only take like seconds to kick in. That's what I thought. Uh, all right, whatever. Forget it. Let's do this. I, I don't know if something's wrong. I, I think he, he might have overdosed. 
I've been made aware that the audio on that video was not sharing properly through Zoom. And as we've all gone through COVID for the past 13 plus months on Zoom, we're okay. We know how to get it to you. So if you would like that video shared with you, simply at the end of the chat, put your email address in and I will make sure to send that along with another video that I'm going to discuss in a couple of moments directly to your email address. In the meantime, I wanna introduce you to Brandon Sun. He's actually one of our task force members who is no longer here to speak for himself. Brandon was over at Freedom High School and had finished his 10th grade year. And he and some buddies went over to the Sunshine Skyway Bridge area. I'm sure many of you have driven by the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. That summer afternoon, they decided they would start experimenting with LSD and things went very badly. Brandon got separated from his friends they searched for him for hours. They couldn't find him. They said, you know what? Let's go ahead and put up some tents. We'll look for him in the morning and then we'll go back to our houses in New Tampa. But unfortunately, they couldn't find him the next morning. And they got in their cars and they drove themselves back to their houses and they told not one person. Those friends of Brandon didn't text a parent, didn't text his brother, didn't stop by the mom's house. Some of them lived right down the street from Brandon. They didn't tell a person in uniform. And 33 hours later, that young boy's body was found floating in the water by the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. I remember thinking when I read about this in the newspaper, didn't those friends of his see a presentation from Nope and know that the 911 law would have protected them? That 911 Good Samaritan law protects anybody from getting help for someone who they think might be overdosing. It was a missed opportunity to let that young man go on to his junior year at Freedom High. This is the 911 Good Samaritan Law that we actually go very much into detail about during your student, your children's presentation. This is Spencer Foster. He was only an eighth grader over at Farnell Middle School. And he had just graduated from the eighth grade, looking forward to being a freshman at Sickles High. But unfortunately, he never made it to his freshman year. Spencer was found dead in his dad's house over the summer. And the autopsy reported to his family that he had been using alcohol and prescription pills throughout the day. When his mom shares his story on a stage, she talks about how she zipped the body bag up around her own child's body before it was taken to the medical examiner's office. This is the last story I'm gonna share with you. This is Drew Karathanasis. You might recognize his shirt. It's a Steinbrenner hockey shirt. He played for Steinbrenner's team, but he went to Alonzo High School and he struggled quite a bit with addiction and his parents put him into treatment got him help. They thought he was doing really well. But one night he went out for a walk after doing some homework. Some kids had posted a video of him on Snapchat that had embarrassed him to the point that he really didn't know what to do because he had been using some prescription medication and cold medicine when they took that video and posted it. And that evening, Drew never returned to his house. His cell phone was found in the bushes close to their home in the West Chase area the next day. And then his twin brother found Drew's body face down in the woods around the corner from the house. A young boy who went to school with Drew and who was with Drew the evening that this happened, he said that they had been taking some of Drew's antidepressant medication. And Drew just took a few extra because he thought it would help him feel a little bit better and less depressed. But that's not how these drugs work. And it actually stopped Drew's lungs totally, shut them down, and he died. The friend never stopped by and let the family know that something went terribly wrong with Drew. And again, it was a missed opportunity to save that young boy's life. I know we all are talking about vaping. That is the current 
trending problem of your teenagers' lives these days. And it is a big deal. It's a bigger deal than before COVID hit. Because now, as kids were at home, able to order on the internet without having to show an ID, they were able to order many devices that normally they wouldn't go into your local little Buddha shop down on Lithia Pinecrest Boulevard or Fishhawk. There are so many smoke shops when I was there visiting the school last week that are within that close proximity to Newsom High. 21 years old is the age for buying devices like that. But unfortunately, as I said, during COVID, these kids had access to more devices than ever before. And the harmful effects are now being shown 20 fold. I know this is a hard image to look at, but Daniel has allowed us to share this image of his body. He started vaping as a freshman in high school. And by the time he was going to enter his junior year, he got very sick. They rushed him to the hospital and his lungs had totally been decimated, totally destroyed from vaping. Daniel was the first double lung transplant recipient in the entire world. And he is now using his tragic story to help save your child, your student, our generation of teens from going down this road. That vaping device is dangerous. The research is out. Everyone has seen that not only does popcorn lung happen and damage lifelong to the respiratory system of teenagers if they start vaping in their teen years and continue. Unfortunately, Daniel is a walking example that his life has changed forever. He actually just tested positive for COVID three weeks ago. And we all know this is a respiratory disease, this coronavirus. And our prayers and our thoughts are with him. So we thank Daniel Ament, who lives in the Detroit area, for sharing this powerful image and story. And by the way, he created a video, peer to peer, to talk to teens that we will be sharing in every note presentation with middle schoolers and high schoolers so they can listen straight from Daniel how vaping went very wrong for him. Now I'd like to introduce Master Deputy. James Howell, who is going to take over and share some information about trending drugs and statistics in the Hillsborough County area. Deputy. Thank you, uh, Beth. Every day, approximately 2,500 teens try prescription pills for the first time to get high. And every day, at least 200 people die in our country from a substance related death. Vaping has reached a crisis level in our country, our state, and our community. This slide shows a variety of vaping devices, many which resemble electronics or school supplies. As parents, you need to understand how serious seeing a vaping pen, an e-cigarette, a jewel, or any type of vaping device is. You have the right to know what your child is up to, who, are they, who they're hanging out with, and what's in their backpack or in their car. Most often you are paying for the car and the insurance. So look through the car for one of these devices. Look through their backpack. It's our responsibility to help guide these teens on the right path. I'd like to talk about marijuana and the messages our teens are receiving about this substance. As they are watching marijuana go through the legalization process, either for medical purposes or recreational use, they are part of a generation exposed to a different take on this drug that is not federally legal in any state. Do you realize the pot of today is not the pot of the 1970s? The THC levels are many, many times higher and drug dealers are oftentimes lacing it with fentanyl, which can kill a human instantly. Please don't think as parents, well, he's just smoking a little weed. This is a serious and dangerous time for your child to be buying, using, or selling drugs. 
The most recent studies say that teens' brains are being altered by marijuana. Take a look at the four throwbacks you might hear from others about pot. What is your stance going to be in your home during these crucial conversations? When thinking about edibles, marijuana brownies usually spring to mind. But edibles actually come in many shapes and sizes. These include cookies, gummies, cakes, hard candies, chocolate bars, and more. Unlike smoking cannabis, where these substances enter the body through the lungs, edibles are introduced through the our edibles introduce the drug through the gastrointestinal tract. The result is a high that is more intense and lasts much longer when you eat it rather than smoke it. It takes longer for the high to kick in when using edibles, so kids tend to keep eating and eating until they end up in the hospital or seriously ill. In fact, several Hillsborough County students have been hospitalized during school hours after being given edibles on campus from so-called friends. This slide shows many trending drugs. A vital role that you play right now is staying informed as a parent, staying involved in your teen's life and knowing when to step in. You should look through their room, their dresser drawers and even their shoes because kids, yes, hide things in their shoes. Many teens are stealing prescription pills from their own family's medicine cabinet or from a relative's medicine cabinet or a friend's. Please lock your drugs up, count your drugs, know what you have on hand. Did you know that you can easily dispose of expired or not needed drugs any day at your local law enforcement agency and many local drug stores such as CVS and Walgreens? During the COVID health crisis, mental health challenges increased, which in turn caused an increase in substance use and abuse. Overdose deaths in Hillsborough County alone rose 72% in 2020 when compared to the year prior. We had 538 people die from overdoses last year in our county. This slide is of, is of Narcan. Narcan is the delivery system for the drug called naloxone. The reason I mention this to you as parents is that every person should be educated about Narcan. We need to understand why and how to use it and the next steps after using it. In easy terms, Narcan reverses an opioid overdose. It allows the person most times to begin breathing again. We administer Narcan so that the person who overdosed can then go to the hospital and get treatment for their addiction. It's important to mention again that you must call 911 first to get medical help on the way and then you peel, place and press the Narcan as shown in this slide. The person will oftentimes overdose again after the Narcan wears off, which is why it's crucial to call 911 first. You can get Narcan in nasal spray form from your local pharmacy without a prescription and possibly for under $20 with insurance. I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about underage drinking and your child. Half of our children are starting to drink by the eighth grade. That's very frightening. But what message are we sending to our kids about drinking alcohol? Are you setting a good example of all things in moderation? House parties. Our state of Florida has what is called a social host liability law that will hold you, the party host, 
liable for any alcohol related injuries that occur as a result of providing alcohol or other intoxicating substances to minors. Do not put yourself in the position to lose your home, your life savings, spend time in jail or tarnish your reputation just to be the cool parent who lets her child have a party at their home. A child who decides to use alcohol or drugs at a very early age, elementary school through high school, ends up with a 45% chance of developing an addiction later in life. Did you know that the human brain is not fully developed until the age of 25? And did you also know that our lungs are not fully developed until the age of 25? Therefore, every single thing your teen is putting into their body is affecting the development of both their brain and their lungs. NOPE really stresses these points during the student presentations. Remember how invincible we felt as teens? It's for that very reason you need to be having these serious conversations starting tonight with your child. We can make a difference if we join forces to help our kids face the challenges of growing up in this culture. Thank you so much, Master Deputy Howell. You know, these are all just sometimes hard to listen to statistics, hard to put our brain around, but these children today are facing so much more than I believe what most of us faced growing up. Between the pressures of social media the things that are available to them through the internet and on the streets, we need to keep our fingers on the pulse of it. So Master Deputy Howell, thank you for that really great information. When we're in the schools, we say at every presentation, addiction holds no prejudice. It does not care what language you speak, what your family's income is, if you live on a park bench or on Park Boulevard. Addiction is touching every corner of every community across our county, our state, our nation, and our country. You know, people looked at me 10 years ago when our son was a junior at Alonzo High School, and that was when his addiction started. Somebody offered him a pill going through Citrus Park Mall one night. He thought it was no big deal to take the pill, and that led him down the road of addiction to oxycodone, hydrocodone, to the point that he was crushing and snorting the pills to keep the high going. I was a stay-at-home mom that owned her own company. I thought I attended every event that my children had, and still, this happened right under our noses. So please, I want to invite Kathy Valdez to begin sharing some tips to maybe, oh my gosh, that's a red flag. My kid I think might be using, or perhaps all of a sudden you found some pills and you're thinking, oh my gosh, what should I do? I found pills in his dresser drawer or her backpack had something that I think is a joint. What should I do? And so Kathy, who again, I mentioned earlier is our chapter president, along with a lifelong educator and a former Hillsborough County administrator is going to help us out with some of these topics tonight. And just as a footnote, please make sure you stay on mute throughout the entire presentation and we will have time for Q&A at the end. Thank you so much for placing yourself on mute unless you are speaking as Kathy will be. Thank you, Beth. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's so important to be aware of what your child is up to and don't catch that Oh, it couldn't happen to me. I think you've already heard enough to know it can happen to anybody. And make sure that you do keep your finger on the pulse of your child's daily life throughout their, teens, throughout their whole teen life. Also, don't be fooled with you should, your child telling you that you shouldn't snoop in their bedroom. Your right is to snoop. It's your house. So just start that habit from early on that you don't have them barricaded in a room that you can walk freely into their room and into their space and look around while you're in there. Because most of us know someone that struggled with or is struggling with substances. Um, 
it's touched every family or friend or relative in, in any group that I've ever spoken to. And it's unfortunate that our country has come to this epidemic of addiction and accidental overdose, and that it is at a crisis level. Having conversations about substances and about substance abuse is on the prevention side of things. That's what you do. Start talking to your teens tonight. So let's talk a minute about some risk factors. These are some factors that make it easier or more likely that individuals will become involved with and possibly addicted to substances. Some of these factors include an early age of, of their first use. And you've already heard <clears throat> that we tell the students in our presentations that if they start using substances and experimenting in the middle school years, that about 45% of them, and we relate that to about half of the auditorium of their peers, will struggle with addiction, most likely, at some point in their life. That is a staggering, staggering thought. Also, family history. We tell them that it runs in families. So while it's not technically hereditary in, in that strict sense, it does run in families and there is a higher likelihood that if there's someone in your family that is addicted or has been addicted or struggling with substances, that that makes it more likely for the student or the individual to as well. <clears throat> also, psychological problems contribute. We know now that more and more, the teen years, that's where psychological problems start coming to view, into view. And so this can put them at a higher risk level for struggling or beginning to experiment with substances. Also, sensation seekers, we all know them. Kids that are daredevils, they never saw anything that they wouldn't try. They have that no fear attitude. Well, you know what? That type of a personality is more at risk than other types of personalities. Also, hanging out with the wrong friends. You know, we always tell our kids, you are who you hang with. And so we need to take a look at their peer group. Because if they have a deviant peer group or ones that are also experimenting, they're more likely to as well. And lastly, if they're surrounded in their social groups or in their families or wherever with some added, the attitude that drug use is not a really big deal, well, then they're gonna probably have, be more at risk for, for begin, struggling with an issue themselves. Chances increase with each one of these risk factors that your child could be in a situation um, of, of risk. And that is why your modeling good behavior when it comes to your own use of alcohol and your abstinence of marijuana use in front of them is crucial. But you know what? There are some things that you're probably doing that are not risk factors are quite the opposite. They're, we call them protective factors. And you're probably doing a lot of these already. And so those would include having strong bonds uh, with the family, making certain that you're spending good quality time and that you're eating meals together, that you're going to events together, but you just have some pleasant quality time together. Also that you're involved with your children's lives that you're involved with them at school, their school life, you're involved with them at home, but in an unobtrusive way. You can, you don't have to be right in the middle of every activity that they do, but you can supervise from the sidelines and that you know what they're doing and that they know that you know what they're doing. Also, setting clear expectations and consequences. Kids really rise to the occasion. If they know what you expect, and they know what the consequences will be for not meeting those expectations, those definitely are protective for that individual. Also, hopefully, you've already started discussing in your family what your views are on use of illegal substances um, that many kids that you know that they know that are experimenting with. You can show them Daniel's double lung transplant picture that we showed you earlier and start a conversation about vaping. That would be a great conversation starter. Also, all this talk and all this worry about um, the legalization of marijuana, 
that would really provide some good dinner time conversation as well, just so they know how you feel on these various topics. But you know, there are some things that, there are some things that are evidence that maybe there's already a bit of a problem. Have you noticed that um, your liquor is watered down? Have you seen uh, the fake, found a fake ID as you've looked into their things, maybe in their backpack or in their room? Are you missing any money or a laptop or a purse or jewelry, a game unit, anything that would be easily pawned to come up with cash to buy vaping oil or pens or weed or alcohol? Is your prescription medication disappearing? I think I can't underscore enough what uh, Deputy uh, Howell said earlier. And that is, it is so crucial that you keep your medication locked up uh, because kids are accessing prescription medication from their parents and from their other family members. Also, have you, in, have you noticed that they're wanting to spend the night over at friends' house more, friends' houses more, or that they wanna go places with friends at their house that you've never even heard of before? Those may be signs or some type of physical evidence that there may be a problem starting. Also, there are some other behavioral kinds of changes that you might, that might indicate a problem as well. If you're noticing that all of a sudden your child is having difficulty falling apart asleep or that he's experiencing or she's experiencing insomnia, that would be something to check into. It could be a, a, an indication of substance use, but it could also be an indication of other things as well. Like I said, these are just possible indicators. They're not concrete, but certainly things you wanna be aware of and check into. Unexplainable napping. You know, if it's totally on a different schedule um, or falling asleep at inappropriate times, maybe nodding off when you're talking with them. So you're in the middle of a conversation and they're just kind of nodding out between awake and sleep. That would definitely be an indication of possible substance use. Also, your child might um, have some significant weight loss or weight gain. Again, this is something that should concern you. It might not mean substance abuse. It could mean substance abuse, but it could mean other things as well. So certainly something that you wanna keep. You just wanna know what their normal is. Be attuned to their normal so that when you see minor changes, you can look into it and address it quickly so it doesn't get out of hand. Also, let's take a look um, at your child during their school years and other types of indicators that there may be some substance use. Have you noticed a lack of personal cleanliness? It seems like one of the first things to go might be the hygiene or the cleanliness. They start to not care about those things as much. Also, um, kind of messy appearances. They just don't, they just don't put the finishing touches to, the, to that. Also, um, paleness, extreme paleness or puffiness in their face. Again, that should be a signal for many things, but it could be substance uh, abuse. Also check their pupils. Small, very small pinpoint pupils is often a sign of opioid use, such as oxycontin, uh, hydrocodone, morphine, heroin, methadone. So take a look at their, their, their pupils as you're speaking to them. And have you noticed that their skin feels clammy or cold or they're heavily sweating? Like we said, these extremes, they would be an indication that there's something that needs to be checked into. And you know, sometimes their behavior, their personality changes also. They might have an abrupt change in mood. They go from a really happy kid to being very sullen or the opposite. They go from being just kind of middle of the road to now they're on these extreme highs with their mood. Those abrupt changes would indicate uh, some sort of a concern. Also blaming or lying, um, especially about their friends, about their possessions. They become very territorial, very disrespectful in that. Um, you might wanna take a look at that. Also withdrawal from family or friends. 
Uh, they don't want to spend time with you. Now that's, parents are going to say, yeah, but that's every teen. It is true that a lot of teens stop wanting to hang around with their parents, but if they really isolate themselves and they don't want anything to do with regular family functions, then that's a concern that needs to be dealt with. Also, schools can really be a good help in helping you realize change. So that's why it's so important. I don't care if it's pre-kindergarten to graduating senior in high school, be involved in their school life, be in contact. And I think schools now make it easier than ever through all of these virtual platforms to be involved with the school and to contact individual teachers. So there needs to be that good communication between school and home so that you know that if there are any problems or uh, with discipline that may be increasing. So a child may you know, really be getting into some trouble that he never did before. You wanna be on top of that. Also daydreaming or falling asleep in class. That should be a signal to teachers and to, to the parents. So we wanna know about that if there's a behavior change in class as well. Also grades, if the grades start deteriorating, look into that. There has to be a reason for grades to deteriorate. As we said time and time again, anything that's a deviation from the norm for your child. Also, if their attendance becomes erratic, they start missing whole days of school, they start skipping school or missing periods of school. So they may go to school, but then halfway through the day, something happens and they're gone. You want to be, I'm sure that the school will be telling you that, but you want to have that relationship with the school so that you know, so you can jump right on that. That could be an indication that there's a problem with some substances. Also, if they have a part-time job, check in with their boss from time to time and see how they're performing. And, you know, you, you can just do that very innocently. If, if it's at a Publix or at a Chick-fil-A or something, you might just Go in there and just say, oh, how's Johnny doing now? You know, with his work, he so enjoys it and see what kind of response you get. Um, also changes in friends. Oftentimes a child may change to a friend group when they start experimenting with substances because maybe the old friend group wasn't really into that. So they find a new friend group to have that kind of an activity with. So you would wanna, you would kind of be, a, if you know their friends, you're involved in their life, you'll know when that group changes. Also, if they become secret about themselves, about their actions, about their possessions, you would want to be on top of that as well. Also, if they were always into sports or hobbies or any type of extracurricular, and all of a sudden now they don't want anything to do with those activities because now they say it's also boring. Well, you know what? You would need to really ask around and you may have to do a little bit of detective work yourself to find out what the situation is and why that change has occurred, but it would be well worth it to investigate that. Also, we want to tell you, do you feel like some of these hit home? I think probably you might see some possibilities in some of these. Maybe you saw a lot of possibility and you feel like you've gotten a punch to your gut. Now we're gonna give you some tools, some suggestions to help you deal with these possible situations with your own child. Don't be misled by the fact that your child's a great kid, that he's intelligent, that he's popular, he's involved in dance or sports or band. These great kids may still fall prey to the disease of addiction. So keep these conversations going. That's the one point we need to leave you with. Really keep the conversations going and those communication lines open with your child. So let's talk about how to talk with your child about this topic. So prior to sitting down with your team, make a plan for talking. Think it through. Don't just do it on the fly because that never works out very well. So have a plan about the main issues that you, want to, that you want to cover and don't lose sight of those points throughout the conversation. When things start hitting close to home, kids are great and everybody else about getting us off track. So keep those points clearly in mind as you go through the conversation. Choose a time when the tensions in the house are low. 
Don't have a conversation when things are just sky high and everybody's on edge. Pick a time, tensions are low, have your plan, address the situation in a calm manner. Choose a time when you have time. So if, it's, if you only have 10 minutes, it's not a good time to start a serious conversation. You want this to be a conversation and you want it to go someplace. So choose a time when you have time. Also, don't discuss um, anything with your child, frankly, when you suspect that they're inebriated or high. So if they come home and you suspect that they've been drinking and that they're, they're drunk, or you think they've been doing some drugs and they're acting just really strange and you think they're high, that's not the time to address it. Nobody's gonna have a good outcome. It will not be a good outcome. So do what you have to do to get through that immediate situation, but choose your talking time for the day after or sometime when you've all kind of calmed down. Uh, be genuine, be yourself. If you're concerned, tell them you're concerned. Don't yell and scream and holler, but tell them that you're hurt, you're concerned. Tell them how you feel, be a genuine person. Don't use scare, scare tactics, because you know what? They don't work, they really don't. Being real and frank and telling them the facts, that works, but not just scare tactics. And don't scold them or shame them or demean them. Actually try to have this conversation and above all, listen to their point of view. When they start opening up, even if you don't like it, it's killing you to hear them say it. You don't approve of it. It's totally different, diametrically opposed to your values listen to them because that's how they feel at the moment. So B, I can't underscore that enough either. Listen, listen, listen. Um, you know, there are many things. There are mental health issues that we talked about that could be at play. It could be the stress of the academics. It could be this whole pandemic thing has got them over the edge because that's been a huge impact in their lives. Um, it could be the social media, you know, they spend a lot of time on social media and a lot happens and it's just can be very distressing sometimes. So listen to what they say, recognize and recognize their feelings and what they're stating to you and then help them problem solve through that. Or at least just have this conversation be, I'm listening, we'll deal with it and then have another conversation for working together for a solution to it. Um, explain yourself though, explain, don't be afraid to have a conversation and explain why you're opposed to drug use. Talk to them about addiction. Talk to them about adults that you know that have had a lousy life because of addiction. Uh, but don't be afraid for that conversation to happen either. And be understanding, but firm. Be supportive and caring, but firm. Know where you're going and don't be afraid to get there and state it. And above all, don't use idle threats or consequences that you're not going to be able to carry out because that will really hurt your credibility and really it'll do more harm than good. So stick to the real things. If the conversation doesn't go the way that you feel it should and you don't feel that you're in a place that you can help your child make better choices, Please, please, please get professional help. Uh, substance abuse is a very serious problem. It can stem from underlying issues that will need to be addressed. On our website, on the NOPE website, we have a whole section under a tab called resources. And there is a, there is a plethora of resources and options that are available right here in Hillsborough County. Some of them are free of charge. Some of them are on a sliding scale. So it's a reduced price. Um, many, many options. The school, I mean, your school is to be commended for, for asking us to share this information with you. And they have counselors also available that could give you good information also about where to go for help. So there's, there are too many resources not to reach out for help if you don't feel like you can adequately address this issue on your own. Remember, oftentimes your child wants help, they just don't know how to ask for it. And they might be in a state of denial about their own problem as well. 
Many who struggle with substance abuse feel that they've got it all under control, no problem, but they really don't. Um, they might have everybody fooled too. They might be attending school. They may be still being able to get good grades. They may be able to keep their substance abuse hidden from their family and sometimes even from their closest friends. But remember, keep those conversations going. You know, there's something else I wanna share with you. Uh, as Beth mentioned earlier, this, this disease of addiction, it can touch any family. My family has been impacted as well. Our only child, Michael, passed away in 2008 at the age of 24 from a prescription drug overdose. This was at the height of those pill mills and he died from a combination of Oxycontin, Xanax and methadone. All of those pills were prescribed by one doctor at one of those pill mills. Here we had a bright student. He came from an involved family. We had an involved extended family. Uh, he had grown up going to church three times a week, actually. He had a very, he had a bright future scholarship, but he started experimenting and eventually he used a back injury as an excuse to visit a known disreputable doctor at one of those pill mills. And after hiding this for two years, he told us and he sought help. But after going to rehab, he once again visited that pill mill. And just a few days later, he overdosed and he was dead. This is a picture that I really cherish because it was about a week before he died. And in this, we were at a family event and I really thought he had turned the corner. He had come out of rehab. I didn't know that he had gone back to the pill mill. So I will tell you, it can happen to anybody and it's devastating when it does. I commend you though, for participating tonight because educating yourself as a parent is the first step and staying involved is the second step. Kathy, thank you so much. I just, I've been doing this with Nope for almost eight years. And every time a family speaker such as Kathy gets on stage or gets on one of these Zoom sessions, I still am brought to tears because it happens so often and it doesn't seem like the cycle is ending. But we tell the students every single time, whether they're in sixth grade or in 10th grade or 12th, whatever, we tell them you can be the change. You are the generation that is gonna break this cycle of selling, buying, and using drugs. But right now it's all about you as the parents, as the educators, as the caregivers, as the adults who want to be informed, you can be a powerful influence in this situation. You may feel helpless at times, I know I did whether it was our son pawning my diamond earrings for money to buy drugs or stealing the battery out of our car. But you were your child's first teacher and you remain his first teacher. So get involved. I don't care if they're a junior in high school and they don't want you on campus. As Kathy said, Hillsborough County School District has made it very easy to stay in touch and in communication all virtually so you didn't even have to show up on campus and embarrass your child. So learn the right way to communicate. I really never screamed at my son who suffered with the disease of addiction. I cried. I begged sometimes for him to stop, but I never screamed at him because I knew it was something he had no control over and it is a disease. But you need to walk the walk. If you're coming home every day after work or getting off your Zoom sessions now during COVID and you're pouring that first cocktail and it turns into three or five, are you walking the walk that you want them to see? Are you smoking weed and saying, it's no big deal, it's gonna be legalized soon in our state, it's already legal recreationally in other states. If you're saying that, that could be why your child is putting marijuana in his vape device and might end up suffering something more than just a civil citation down the road. So be the wall, set the parameters. Kids thrive on having boundaries, even if they act like they don't. 
they need boundaries. They thrive with boundaries, even when they're in high school and be the wall. Follow through on that consequence that you said you were going to deliver, but also praise and reward the great things that your child is doing. Make sure they know how much you appreciate the great things that they do. And family meals continue to show up in research as being one of the most powerful tools to stay connected with your child, whether it's elementary, middle, or high school. And I'll leave you with one last tip, and then we'll go into questions and answers. I want to remind you to talk to your student, your child, about having a code word or a code phrase for those times when they start to venture out of the house now that COVID is kind of subsiding some and say they go to a party or they go to an overnight or they go over to play video games and something just doesn't feel right to them and they want to get out, but they don't want to seem like the uncool kid. Have a phrase that when your child texts you, the penguin is in the room or Domino's pizza was just delivered or could you order Domino's for me? Whatever your phrase and agreed upon thing is, you know your child wants to be picked up. You know your child needs an out. Even if you call them and say, hey, listen, Steve, I need you home. We have a family emergency. And both of you know it's all bogus. So make sure you talk to your child and start these conversations tonight be the wall, walk the walk, talk the talk, but continue to snoop because it's your house, it's your car, you're paying the insurance, and you have every right to walk in that room and see what's going on. So again, we commend you, Deputy Howell, myself, Kathy Valdez, and we have Principal Rocha and some of the other administrators from Newsom. Thank you for being here. Thank you for showing up. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And if you want to go back onto what is called gallery view on Zoom and you want to have a question answered, take yourself off of mute, or you can type it into the chat area that was created where you see chat, the little dialogue bubble at the bottom of your screen. And I know not everybody is as well versed in Zoom as others, but at the bottom of your screen, if you just run your cursor over it, there's a chat dialogue and that'll get you to the chat or just click over the red microphone that has a line through it that will unmute you. And you can ask a question of any of us, whether it's Principal Rocha, Master Deputy Howell from Newsom, Kathy, or myself. I don't hear anything and I don't see anything in the chat area. I will tell you that um, if you do want to share your email address and you don't want to do it in the chat area, which I so respect, I'm going to give you our Gmail account so that you can email me to get a video of the PSA, the public service announcement that did not quite play correctly along with the video that Daniel Lament, if you remember him, the double, double transplant gentleman, the double lung transplant gentleman, um, I'll send you the video that he created as well that will be shared in your child's school if you are a parent in Hillsborough High School. Um, right now, we do have a question in the chat that says, what is the school doing to monitor vaping in the bathroom? So I'm gonna put myself on mute and Deputy Howell or Principal Rocha, Either of you are more than welcome. I really don't know what the policies are on campus for that. Katie, would you like for me to address that or would you like to do that yourself, ma'am? No, you're absolutely welcome to answer that. Thank you, Deputy Howell. <clears throat> okay, yeah. Uh, Beth, could you repeat the question for me? Of course. What is the school doing? to monitor vaping in the bathrooms? Well, the school uh, quite honestly uses a variety of different techniques to try to uh, monitor vaping on campus. Uh, in regards to what we physically do, it's very common for myself, quite honestly, and for administrators, both male and female, to uh, step into the bathroom during passing periods. Uh, 
oftentimes when we step into the bathroom, there are a lot of students uh, in the bathroom uh, and sometimes uh, some of those students uh, exit without using the bathroom, quite honestly. So we know that sometimes students are congregating in the bathrooms and, and maybe uh, are engaged in other things, but we do actively uh, step into bathrooms and just make certain that uh, we don't actually physically see any vaping occurring. Now, in the event that we do see vaping occurring, those particular uh, students are escorted to, to student affairs and an investigation is, is conducted and they are disciplined appropriately. The other things we do though also is we do encourage students uh, to the degree that we can get students to, to sometimes cooperate with us. We encourage them to provide us with information about anyone who might have vaping materials in their possession or might be vaping on campus. And if we have information that we believe is credible and is fresh, then we address that uh, situation by making contact with, with students and by uh, interviewing students and if necessary, conducting administrative searches of those students to determine whether they do in fact have vaping materials in their possession. So. Th those are some of the things that we do. There are times also that we review uh, video surveillance uh, of the bathrooms. Uh, and we're not, you know, we're not certainly not trying to uh, take away the privacy of our students. But if we see a large congregation of students going into a bathroom, uh, that might be a signal for us that we might need to step into the bathroom and just check and make sure uh, about what's happening in that bathroom. We also use those surveillance techniques uh, during uh, non-passing periods. Uh, some students will utilize the bathrooms not during passing because we, they know that administrators are, are quite honestly all over the campus and all over the place during passing. Uh, but rather than do that, they'll wait and go to their class and then request permission to use the bathroom. Uh, occasionally we're able to determine that a, a person is, is uh, abusing that privilege or groups of people are moving into a bathroom, uh, maybe during a class period, and we would investigate that. Uh, so those are some of the things that we, uh, some of the techniques that we use on campus to try to uh, keep a handle on, on vaping activities that are occurring. Thank you, Deputy Howell. And just to add to that, uh, please understand that our belief is what we're we trying to educate our students, see something, say something, and, and really making sure that they understand um, that what they are abusing it is not really good for them. So we're trying to have those individual conversations and, and making sure that any time if we find a student in possession of any vaping device, that parent is contacted immediately and, and providing services. Um, we do offer services for students um, and it is up to parents to make sure that they take advantage of the services. Uh, through Newsom High School or the district. Um, so those conversations are taking place. Also, please know that it's not just administrators, but with 135 um, teachers, uh, they take a very active role in monitoring our students um, during class, in between classes, um, and, and the random walking into the bathrooms. Uh, I mean, we're all over campus. We take really pride to making sure that we are present and, and we are there for the students. But it takes a village to raise a child and, and we're asking for help. Um, if you have any information that our children have access to things because they cannot purchase them at Newsom High School, they're getting them from outside and they're bringing them on our campus. Um, so please make sure that you reach out to Deputy Howell. Please make sure you reach out to um, our administrative team. Anything that is brought to our attention, we investigate. We may not always have the answers and we, due to a student privacy, we may not be able to give you the details, but we collect that information and we act on that information. So I, I hope that between myself and Deputy Howell that we answer those questions, but encourage your kids and a lot of kids are doing an amazing job is because they will reach out to administrators, they will reach out to teachers and they will speak up and they will let us know of what is happening. Um, and it's, so the belief is we all in this together, 
Um, if you have any information, please let us know, um, because once it comes to our attention, the expectation is we do have to investigate and we have to follow up. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Principal Rocha, very much. Uh, we do have a question. How can you tell the difference between a package of real gummy bears and drug related gummy bears or edibles? Are there any special clues on the packaging that can help parents realize that? I don't have firsthand information about this, so I welcome anybody who's on the session, if they know anything about this, how you can tell, because kids are creative, right? They're gonna take them out of the packaging that they bought them on in the internet if it did say that it was something that involved THC levels of some kind or CDB in it, um, and they're gonna put it into a regular baggie. I mean, they're pretty astute at those kinds of things, but anyone that wants to add to that I don't really know what the difference on packaging for those are, as opposed to the pop tarts that were pot tarts on the slide that Deputy Howell shared. That was pretty obvious. Deputy Howell, do you have an insight on that? Can you give us any specifics? Well, to be honest with you, uh, my experience in regards to some of the edibles are that <clears throat> the packaging, you know, uh, is not necessarily the original packaging that an item comes in. Uh, most of the cases that I've been involved in, quite honestly, with edibles, uh, it's very difficult to do the prevention and prevent that from happening. Uh, occasionally, you're lucky enough to do that, but normally it's an after effect, meaning that an edible is passed to someone and uh, ultimately they consume it, and then that person either... Uh, presents in such a way that you know that person is intoxicated or high, or what many times happens, parents, is that uh, the student winds up in the nurse's office. And then we begin the investigation at that point as to why they're down in the nursing office. And, and normally, uh, given their situation there, we're able to get students to cooperate and let us know that they have ingested something. And, and then because we, we basically take the position that, look, we have to know why you're experiencing what you're experiencing because we need to provide medical assistance to you. And so it's in your best interest to be honest with us. And that's oftentimes how we, we uncover those situations. Uh, I have been involved with a high school that had a, a situation where uh, marijuana cookies uh, were something that were being distributed at times at that particular high school. and once the administration got onto that, they were able to go back and use surveillance video and track people who were moving around the cafeteria and providing those, those items. But the packaging itself, uh, you know, that is, that's an area that would be relatively difficult to, to uh, determine, uh, quite honestly. Uh, the packaging at, at, that I've seen in high schools, uh, some of it is obvious that it, it involves uh, marijuana because it has an actual marijuana leaf, a small logo of a marijuana leaf on that packaging. But short of seeing something that uh, positively indicated that that item, uh, you know, contained THC, uh, it's difficult to, to use the packaging as a way to, to get to the truth in regards to what that is. Much of it, again, is repackaged differently and it's very hard to tell that what's in that package may have marijuana in it. All right, I had another question come up about what, what could they do if they miss part of the presentation? And I told them that it is being recorded. It will be sent over to Principal Rocha to share within the Newsom family, as well as being on our social media site of NOPE and also our YouTube channel. So that is where it will be available to be seen. Any other questions before we wrap up for this evening? And again, as Kathy and Deputy Howell said, thank you so much for being here for yourself, for your child, for your family. It's not an easy topic, but it does have answers. And those resources that we list on our website that Kathy Valdez spoke about, there are so many resources, whether it's Parents Against Vaping or whether it's HCADA, which is Hillsborough County Anti-Drug Alliance, you are not alone in this. We are here to help, but you also need to be here to help if you could please. Principal Rocha, did you have something else that you wanted to say in closing? 
I just want to say thank you, Beth and Kathy and Deputy Howell for a great presentation. We, we truly appreciate it. it. It really takes all of us to send the information out. The one thing to the parents, um, if I could just say, um, and I think this was mentioned in the presentation, get into those backpacks, get into that uh, room um, and, and start seeing what is happening because it sometimes is really not a surprise of what the students are bringing. Uh, they're coming from home uh, with those uh, devices um, and, and have those conversations. But just know that you're not in this alone. Uh, we are here to help you. Please reach out to us. We'll be happy to guide you, answer any questions, and, and have those private conversations through with a guidance counselor, with administrator. Um, so we are welcome uh, your calls because we're here to support you. But uh, I really appreciate that evening, that this presentation, and thank you for um, sharing the very important information with our parents. Appreciate it. Very much. You're very welcome. I did put our email address back into the chat room one more time. If anybody wants any of the videos that I referenced, email us at nopehillsborough at gmail.com if you don't want your email address shown publicly in the chat room. Otherwise, have an amazing night. Good night, Deputy Howe. Good night, Kathy. Good night, everyone, and thank you for being here this evening. Stay well and stay safe.